Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit podcast. And my guests today were actually unknown to me until a couple of weeks ago. And we do a little group on a Friday night, Fruity Fridays. And uh, this couple joined and they just they just exuded, you know, this life force health energy at, at us uh, through the Zoom screen. And um, we, they told us about an amazing story about their family and everything. And uh, we'll get into that today. So I'm here with uh, Layla and Patrick McGuinness, who I believe living in Hawaii at the moment. And um, very interesting, Patrick was a, a professional soccer, soccer player. Layla is an author. So we're going to find out more about all that. And I should just mention the Fruit Festival in the UK. If you're here in the UK or interested, uh, you can find out more at fruitfest.co.uk if you want to find out more about the festival. And you can specifically go to fruitfest.co.uk slash registration if you want to find out about signing up for this year's event from the 29th of July to the 6th of August. We thank you for your support and for listening and hello guys is there anything you would like to say about yourself um to introduce yourself hey ronnie oh we're just we're just happy to be here and and share what we can to to support the message and and yeah we're grateful to be here with you for sure yeah we had a great uh, i loved the um the night we had the the fruity fridays when you were talking a lot about um, one of your pregnancies and one of the births you had, which was great. But before we get into that, maybe you can both tell us a little bit about your own personal story, because sometimes we like to ask people, uh, you know, what was your background? How did you grow up? You know, what was your tra- what was your journey towards better health, raw vegan diet, and all that kind of stuff? Maybe, maybe Layla, you can go first and tell us about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up actually spending about half of my childhood in the hospital or in doctor's offices. Uh, I was a very, very sickly young girl. Um, I had all kinds of major illnesses and diseases, um, which a lot of people that come to this lifestyle have had eczema and asthma, and then it kind of developed into further complications as I got into my teens where I had So multiple major organs removed, um, gallbladder surgery, appendix taken out and um, and more things that occurred. And I was surprised as I got older that the doctors were just so um, confused as to why I was experiencing the things that I experienced and they couldn't find a cause. And I just really felt like something was wrong with me. And I felt very disempowered and helpless and Um, it was, it was a really difficult way to live, but deep inside of me, I knew that there was, um, a different world that could exist. I knew that there were the answers to all of my questions. And, um, I knew that my life could be healthy and that I could be strong and that I really could kind of come out of this sickly, miserable life. And, a lot of it had to do with really differentiating from my family to the degree where I think when I was about 16, I I learned through some PETA articles about um, what was going on. And because of my love for animals, um, I just turned vegan overnight. And then uh, with different health things that had been going on, I realized that it was kind of correlated with the journey toward greater health. And so I felt really grateful to find a path that kind of, you know, brought awareness to something I was doing that I wasn't aware of. And also um, that was more in alignment with my integrity and my desires for greater health. And so um, over the years after that, I I found out uh, about raw foodism. And um, although I did have a period when I went to graduate school to study psychotherapy where I was uh, friends with a medical student who told me that they really thought that I needed to be eating meat because of what I had been doing. And, and I was, my muscle was eating away at itself. And because I was kind of misinformed and about the academic portion of what I was doing with veganism, I really kind of fell into those traps. I knew I wanted to become a mother and I wanted to be healthy and, 
And so I did go back to some of my old ways for a period of maybe three or four years. Um, I had my first pregnancy um, and we, we did all of our, our pregnancies and our childbirths completely on our own without any medical professions or midwives or doulas or any um, other guidance other than our own intuition. Uh, we are homesteading and we can talk more about that later, but um, I was not vegan for my first pregnancy, but we did have a, an amazing free birth. But for my second uh, birth and pregnancy, every day I would wake up during my pregnancy and I'd be asking, what do I need to eat today? What do I need to do today? What do I need to believe today in order to have the most fulfilling childbirthing experience? And I was amazed that through these questions and this prayer and meditation every day that I was, I kept hearing raw foods, raw foods. And once we did a lot of, ex, um, a lot of research, Patrick came across the 80, 10, 10 lifestyle. And we just said about halfway through the pregnancy, let's give this a go. We know that we can feel better, that we can have clearer minds, that we can be happier. And we really felt like this was the way to it. And it totally was, it was the most amazing pregnancy and the childbirth was spectacular, which maybe you wanna go into at another time. But um, after the childbirth happened, I knew that this was the diet for my life. If I wanted to live a happy, healthy, amazing life, that this was going to be a big part of it, the high fruit lifestyle. And I've just been blown away getting happier, healthier, stronger every day. And I'm just a completely different person than I was when I was a child. And so I feel so grateful and it's such a wonderful opportunity to share with people like yourself, Ronnie, who are so beautifully bringing together people across the globe who are, you know, have an affinity for this lifestyle. And so, yeah, thank you so much for thinking of this. And I think that's all I'll share for now. Awesome. Well, be before we get into your story, Patrick, just, let me just ask you a couple of questions there because that's really, you, you're saying you, you had your gallbladder removed and your appendix removed, like really young. That's, 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 that seems unusual to me, but were you quite sick then? Is that what the case was? I was, I was. Every single time I ate, I would have this horrible pain in my stomach. And this was mm -hmm. around like maybe when I was 11 years old, 12 years old. We had a lot of stuff going on in my family too that was really devastating. And so I think that kind of had a role to play as well, kind of like the emotional, mental, spiritual aspect. But of course the dietary was a huge piece of it. Every single time I would eat, I would just be healed over in pain for an hour sometimes and nobody knew what was wrong. And so, you know, unfortunately I didn't have doctors that were kind of curious about what are you eating? What are the things you're putting in? What's going on with your entire system and the lymphatic system and, the, and you know, so it was kind of a quick solution. They thought just, we'll just take out the gallbladder because it's functioning less than optimally. And so that was the course it took. And unfortunately I didn't really know that I had a choice at that age. So I just went along with it because I thought it would make me feel better. Um, did you personally offer you any, any alternative? Did, did, were you offered like you should change your diet, anything like that? Any advice at the time? Oh. Um, no, unfortunately, I didn't even know about alternative medicine until I was in my early 20s. Um, I since then have, you know, take have gone come to acupuncture have come to some other types of healing Reiki and uh, massage at different times. But um, even those things feel like they're a complement to the mm -hmm. diet and to the lifestyle. But if you really hone in and perfect the diet, I don't even really feel like those things are necessary. And that's kind yeah. of been proven to us at this point. But for, for whatever reason, it seems like the way we both grew up, that that wasn't part of the culture. Suburban America didn't even think about that unless you were like a, you know, a, a hippie or some fringe character. It was like, no, you don't feel good. You take this or that thing from over the counter. And if it gets worse, then you go see somebody. And if it gets worse, then you're at, just at the, you know, at that, yeah. that process. But yeah, nobody, were, and it, they loved us. Our parents loved us very much, but they just, they for whatever know. reason, none of us thought to ask those questions of like, oh, maybe what you just put in there has something to do with the way you feel. The only reason, I, the only reason I brought this up is interestingly enough, my, brother's wife recently had a gallbladder issue and she was actually told 
that she could either get the operation or she could change her diet, which is very interesting to me that she was given that option. I think they, they actually told her to give up red meat and give up dairy and a few other things. And she's actually done it and I think she's doing quite well. So, so something's maybe changing now. I don't know. I was very amazed to hear that, but that's quite good. Um, yeah. Patrick, were you brought up like standard American diet or how did it go for you? Yeah, exactly. It was it was pretty standard, but even within the standard, <clears throat> um, we thought we were eating pretty healthy. I mean, my parents wanted the best and they would, you know, buy what they thought were the healthy options, which in that case was like the pizza with a few more vegetables on it or, you know, have a salad with dinner or, you know, whatever it might be. But it was still within that that understanding, which wouldn't really think that health necessarily had everything or so much to do with the diet yeah. it was more like they had it I, they had some good you know good advice growing up like exercising and looking after your body and being a nice person and things like that but it wasn't to the point where they could associate um less than ideal physical conditions to you know big dietary choices or seeing like the health effects of eating meat or in, in large amounts and, and things like that. So they wanted the best, but it's still that like a few of the pieces didn't connect in the, in the way that they do more mainstream today. Um, yeah, and, and, and when did you, I mean, you became a professional soccer player. So when did that start? Were you playing very young? Was it a, a, was your family kind of sport? You kind of mentioned they encouraged you to exercise. So what was that? Yeah, we, that all happen? We were, Really, pretty, uh, pretty involved with the sports, and it, it just ended up soccer. You know, pulled me in a little bit, and I, I really enjoyed that. But um, for sure, I think that that tied in too with my my interest in health because you know you want to you know be the best you can be, and and it's like okay, how can I get an advantage? A huge advantage was you know looking after your health, and and for whatever reason, during that time, a lot of the information there was you know some of the high protein you know eat your meat and lift weights and that kind of approach and and I guess in some ways that did get some benefits for the short term but um you know as that was sustained over a longer period I started to really see like oh I thought I was doing it right but it clearly I wasn't getting the best information because it wasn't something I could sustain and it wasn't yeah. like I mean, it would be really stimulating when you have a lot of that, that meat and you know, kind of like feel powerful and aggressive <laughs> and, and angry. And like in some way that does help your sports performance. But then like doing that over years and years, you're like, oh, I can't play sports anymore. Look oh, at this yeah. growth and like all these, un yeah, or the recovery, all the undesirable things that I mean, even at that time, I didn't know. I didn't realize this now until I look back at, at those years and say, oh, maybe my soreness wasn't because I was mm. training so hard. My soreness was just because I was making bad choices, you know. Mm -hmm. So during, yeah. during your career playing soccer, you were, were you given any specific like nutrition advice? I know that there's some clubs that they, they do try and limit certain things that players are, are eating. And, and I know that some clubs they're very um strict on weight they, they get the players yeah. to weigh, weigh themselves all the time and stuff like that yeah for for whatever reason when i was when i was there nutrition was encouraged but there wasn't somebody saying you know don't eat this or don't eat that it was more like oh make sure you get your gatorade get plenty of gatorade in and don't eat too soon before the match and and uh get drink milk after the game like I, I <laughs> silly things that wasn't yeah not like today where it's like actually a, a vocation for a lot of the clubs to have somebody doing that it was more like fruits and ve get your fruits and veggies five a day kind of just standard mm. american health information um and were you always you were always eating meat you weren't you were never a uh, vegan as a as a when you were playing sports no, I was, I was never vegan. That just never entered my mind because I it was so ingrained that the meat was the powerful component, the, you know, the proteins and the animal foods were the strength giving components. That's just how we, we grew up. 
even without outside of sports, everybody knows that milk makes you strong and meat is like what you're eating at night. And, and the more of it, the stronger you get. I mean, not everybody believed that, but my little bubble, what I had surrounded myself with thought that. And um, so that was, that was really interesting to see how, how those beliefs informed my choices and then to see how that all of a sudden stopped working. And I had to stop being athletic just because it was too painful. I had to stop doing all these things I love just because my body was screaming. And uh, over the course of this journey that we've been on together, I've slowly been able to connect a few of the dots. I mean, we're still all, always learning, but we're just so grateful to have found this information because it's just brought so many amazing changes to our life, to our bodies and to our daily life. And mm -hmm. like Layla said, we just appreciate the work that you and the others do around it in terms of spreading the message, because it's funny you mentioned, we didn't really know each other until this last week, but we, we've kind of been, we've been not active with the community, but we've been getting, you know, Ronnie's stuff every few weeks on the email and we see your, your, the oh, features nice. that, you, whether it's you or uh, people in other countries and just kind of like learning and getting that that confirmation of like oh this is this actually is an option for people this this we don't have to believe the you know, <laughs> the, the the all the the things that we grew up believing mm, yeah it's, it's it's fascinating yeah but it's it's really great that yeah the people are starting to you know come together a bit more in little groups and all that I, I, that's what i really love trying to trying to help that happen but um what i find interesting you're talking about there like the idea that at the end of your career like your body like you basically almost i don't want to say you can't play anymore but maybe you couldn't play to the same level and i've, I've heard that a lot with athletes and i don't know if that's partly to do with how much they play and then play when they're in pain and injured and all that stuff and how much that is connected with diet also breaking their body down at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just, I, I just want to see more people, you know, more health, more people in raw vegan diets and sports and stuff and see how much farther they can last. Yeah. Interesting to see. Yeah. It's really, it's really interesting because there's so much information out there, especially in the sports culture about what to be, taking in and then you know obviously especially with some of the stimulants and and you know chemical stimulants or just stimulants in the food that sort of give these these little effects that that help you in sports but then might not be so ideal you know after the game it's sort of that and then like you say then you try to cover that up with some other uh stimulant or or drug or or food or whatever it might be and then it's just almost just too many moving parts it's even hard to make make understanding um about so yeah it's it would be neat to see to see more of the information get to you know it, it already is i mean so many of these high performance athletes that are so inspiring to us that that really really helped us start believing in this this lifestyle i mean we're we're really grateful for those people that that you know the the long distance runners or the whoever it might be that's you know spreading the fruit message is like wow yeah it can be you can be performing and it can be enjoyable rather than sort of like this hardcore athlete that's you know performing well but there's a lot of just like self hatred and and covering up of the the undesirable effects until their career's over and then they just become a mess. Very cool. Well, we'll get, let's get more into the, the diet and everything. One, one quick question before we get into all that. Did you play with or against any famous players that we'd all know? Or what? what oh, I'm trying um, to what, what the level your career was at or where you were playing and everything. And Yeah, well, I, 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 I got, after, uh, after playing in university, I got drafted by Kansas City at the time. They have a different name now, but it was in Kansas City. And and some of the bigger names there were uh, a guy named Precky. He's a pretty famous American um, soccer player and also another World Cup player on our team was Josh Wolf and uh, Jimmy Conrad were kind of the, the, some of the bigger, more known players there. And it was interesting because 
I, I didn't connect the dots until uh, long after, but it's it's funny looking back. Preki was always the one like eating fruit oh, after yeah. the and stuff, and nobody was even saying why or even thought about it at the time. But when I think back, it's like, oh, okay, that that's starting to make more <laughs> sense. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, you, you, yeah. You, you know, there was a, there was um. Uh, a, a player from England from years ago. His name was. Uh, his name will come back to me in a moment. But he was, like, I'm talking the 1950s, maybe the 1940s, like a, a player from way back. But his career lasted till he was like 50, literally 50 years old. And I thought this guy must have been doing something totally different. And when I started to investigate, he was basically vegetarian. He was. He would do fasts. He was doing like. I think he had like vegetable juice every day. Like he he did all this stuff way back then, you know. So uh -huh. it's, it's, some people figured it out and managed to like extend their career, I suppose. Um, yeah, I can't remember his name, but he was he was like iconic player in in England. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's yeah, it's even interesting to see that in the mainstream now. I mean, we don't get the whole story, but even little, you know snippets like oh Messi and Ronaldo are being encouraged to eat more vegetables and fruit <laughs> like yeah, yeah. I don't know how much truth there is in it but at least it's part of the conversation you know for sure so yeah. how, did, how did you guys meet each other and Layla were you you were a vegan at the time when you met I think or or what well, exactly actually I was in graduate school um in Boulder actually and that was when I had gotten my message from this friend about the that I needed to incorporate more mead and and I tried to I mean it was so distasteful to me because I had been away from it for so long that I really did not enjoy the process so it was very limited but um, I then left when I left school I always felt like when I was in these transitional times and when I didn't really know what direction my life was taking or what I was going to do or what I wanted to become, I always felt drawn to eating raw foods because I felt like it gave me the clarity that I wanted. It gave me the mental happiness and a certain degree of freedom to be able to kind of move beyond these limitations and these fears that I would almost immediately feel as soon as I incorporated cooked food again. And so it's really kind of a fascinating dance with that where I would almost, even though I was still starting to incorporate more animal products during that time, I still knew that this was a tool that I could use at any time. And I didn't realize that it could become such a prominent part of my life, but I kind of always dreamed that it would. And I, I kind of always dreamed that I would be able to meet somebody that would be a raw foodist and and, you know, and it was, it just so happened that when we met, you know, we were both kind of, I don't even know if I would have met him actually, to be honest, if I wasn't kind of into the meat thing, because we were really kind of um, big on homesteading and doing all of our stuff on our own. We went through a period when we met where we were, you know, we had our own goats for milking and we just were kind of, you know, had our own oh, chickens wow. and doing everything on our own and, and we also for this period of like seven years although that whole period we weren't you know eating eating meat or or non-vegan but we were cooking like only with fire and doing everything from a very rootsy place growing all our own vegetables and a lot of our own fruits and so we kind of got to experience what it was like to be completely self-sufficient on an omnivorous diet and uh, and it was a lot of work and just so much work to the degree where, you know, when we, we were like, we're finally living this dream of, you know, really providing for ourselves and we have it all lined up, but like, we didn't feel as good as we knew we could feel and our mm -hmm. state of mind wasn't as good as we knew it, it could, it could be. And so that really opened our eyes and our curiosity really led us to kind of explore, like maybe we're not quite doing the mm -hmm. su the self sustainably sustainability mm -hmm. thing quite right. You know, maybe mm -hmm. there's a different way we could do it where we we would be happier and we would feel better, and it wouldn't there wouldn't be so much guilt for working with these animals and you know the, all these these things that just didn't quite feel mm -hmm. in alignment. 
integrity, but were somehow aligned with some concepts and beliefs that were still lingering in our minds. Were you, were you, guys, so, were you able to like make most, uh, produce most of your food yourself at that point? Were you? Yeah. How, how absolutely. did that look like? What did that look like? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, do, do you want to milk and did you have yeah. vegetables and? We grew a lot of taro. Bread. Oh, taro. Well, I, I should say that we went through different periods. So like when we were living on the mainland United States, we were, you know, up high in the mountains. And so that was like a seasonal thing of we would grow our own wheat and grow our own peas and beans and dry that and, and then grind our bread with the hand mill and then oh, bake wow. a sour bread loaf and then have that with eggs from the chickens and milk from the goats and and cheese from the the neighbor and then we'd have the dried vegetables from that that winter and the pumpkins that were in the root cellar and kind of the that the north american high mountain version of mm -hmm. that but then our life we were living in a totally different um place we were in the tropics and we had coconuts and we'd be <laughs> making breadfruit we would do you know taro and breadfruit kind of like trying to to relive the old hawaiian right. tradition and and that was that was more fruit based and and vegetables year round and we let go of we didn't do the goats but we just had chickens but we did a lot of cooking and it was like that was the basis and and like Layla said it i we were trying to follow this this idea we had of health and saying going back to the land it's going to be healthy and going um to traditional diets is going to be healthy i mean traditional in the last whatever how many generations but we thought those things were going to be healthy. And then it was this eye-opening experience mm -hmm. to actually be doing it after years of preparation to like immerse ourselves in this old way of living. And we got there and our bodies, uh, or I'll speak for myself, I just totally got destroyed. I mean, it just oh, wow. destroyed. Really? I, yeah, like. But even though, you, even though there was no processed food and it was all natural, all organic and everything, it wasn't working for you? It was not working for me, Ronnie, and I don't know. I don't know why. It just felt like almost like the inevitable tug in this direction, and that's why. I, I mean, we're still learning, but at the same time, it's it's been, it's been almost like, we we thought that was going to be such a great idea, mm. and and then it just it it just didn't work physiologically. It just wasn't working, and and mentally. But, I, I think that was the main thing yeah. for me was I've I've been trained as a psychotherapist and so I'm really really oriented on mental health and I just felt like the diet even though it was to a certain degree really natural the way we were doing it and we were so connected with our food and it was really rewarding in a certain way even though that was the case there still were just these lingering you know, really negative thoughts and depression and, you know, just so wow. much fear. And it really would only take about three days of eating 100% raw foods to finally start to like lift that veil and be oh, wow. experiencing fearless, this fearlessness again mm -hmm. that I knew was a possibility. And so, you know, it got to a point where we both just looked at each other and we're like, this isn't working. Like we're, we're harvesting all these amazing fruits from the trees. And of course we, you have to cook red fruit. So we were doing a lot of that. And we were, you have to cook taro because it's poisonous raw. Right. And we were eating that we really, we spent hours a day on the fire cooking. And that was really rewarding in itself too, just to be able to, you know, see what it takes to really cook something up in a, in a really organic way. But we looked at each other and we're like, we can feel better. Mm -hmm. Like this doesn't, mm -hmm. life doesn't have to be this kind of like dark negative mind state and this bodily kind of, you know, cathartic experience. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying to Patrick, I was like, I really think there's just something about the raw food diet that, you know, really intrigues me. And of course, when I did it at first, it was high, high fat. And I still kind of believed in the like, oh, fruit causes candida and to try to stay away from it. But then I would like eat all my gourmet raw food meals and then like binge on a bunch of dates because my body just knew that it needed those sugars. 
then I'd feel bad about it. But once we did research, he was like, no, I think it's the, the high fruit that's, you know, that's like even more optimal than the raw food gourmet diet that I did before. So when we experienced that, we really went in on that together for the first time. And that was just a whole nother level of, I would say the happiness factor was like times a million doing it with high fruit as opposed to minimizing the fruit and doing lots of green juices and all these other things, which are a great compliment to it. But the fruit is like, if you want to have a happy life, the fruit is just where it's at. There's just no questioning about it in yeah. me anymore. It's so interesting. Like, I think that people are so disconnected from the reality of like what you try to do with producing all your own food and everything and processing your food, cooking it. I've, I've sometimes watched little programs of, you know, traditional methods of harvesting certain foods and the amount of steps involved, the amount of labor that can be involved in preparing things like bread, like is a, well, a lot more, I think, than and a lot of time is a lot more than what people realize. And people just go to the shop and pick up bread, you know, and it's like for someone else back in the day, it's like an all day process just to get that yeah. you know, started. Yeah. And, and like, well, uh, yeah yeah I, I must say that you you really come to appreciate it like once you get right. to meal like this amazing <laughs> experience of everything that went into it and this tremendous sense of like independence and mm. and almost power yeah in a way but but then yeah like we said the the downsides of that are you know the health effects and and just you know everything that that could, it could have been more ideal if we had known more uh, yeah. about had if we'd had more information at that time about health we could have been putting all that time and energy into things that that were more promoting of our health rather than yeah. than just continuing a traditional mm -hmm. method um and we did we did get a chance to start over which was great because we left our homestead where we had been doing different animal husbandry practices and working with animals and we ha got a whole new property of seven acres and we set aside six acres of it for conservation and then we developed one acre of it by hand where mm -hmm. we actually built an entire house just him and i and of course oh. with the help of kids like you know baby yeah. babysitting each other essentially they helped with little projects here and there but we we were able to build this yeah. entire house almost almost entirely powered by fruit. Yeah. And then yeah. we planted like, probably by the time we left, there were thousands of fruit trees on this prop on this one acre that we that we created. And um, so we were able to plant all the bananas and plant all the papayas and, and produce a lot of our own food, um, fruitarian, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lifestyle permaculture scene and it was mm -hmm. it was really magnificent tons of dragon fruit and lots of mm -hmm. exotic kind of mediterranean crops crops because we were on a particular part of the island that was more in that climate zone and why, so that was why, why did you move to hawaii did you had you already got interested in eating more fruit or was it was it just the weather or something different no so yeah we we ended we ended up moving to hawaii before we were into the raw raw vegan fruit based diet we we just went there for other reasons to to volunteer and just to to participate in in a different climate really um the winters where we were are pretty pretty severe and at a certain point we wanted to be spending more time outside year round and able to garden more because we were still really into gardening but um not exclusively that it was like Layla said we were pretty omnivorous and but Hawaii was the opportunity to do that year round and so we went there and maybe after three or four years we came into the the raw food uh, fruit-based diet and then started everything that we had been doing with the the land and sort of uh, localized living sort of transitioned to a fruit focus and that's where it got just so much more fun and so much more, you know, sustainable because we actually felt like we could, you know, walk around without getting sick every couple months. Or we got energy. 
yeah. from what, what we ate. And, yeah. and it was so simple. I mean, there was a lot of harvesting of huge banana racks involved. And I mean, mm -hmm. we would probably harvest hundreds of pounds of fruit a week, wow. you know, maybe sometimes going into over a thousand just in terms of how much, you know, how many different crops we were growing and how, you know, mm -hmm. our papayas were like this big. Oh, wow. It was just phenomenal. Really, you guys, really having your kind of background with um, homesteading and stuff like that, do, do you think it's, how possible would it be for someone to be able to live for a whole year, for example, growing their own food in a place like Hawaii on a raw vegan diet? Do you think it's possible for someone to do that? just you're saying just growing their own from their own land. yeah like 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 growing like is there a way of doing that or would you need a lot of land a lot of trees or like I, I, how, much, how much food can you grow you know yeah i on think hawaii. on hawaii you could or Definitely. or in florida or other trop sim, subtropical places from our experience it's pretty it's pretty doable but it does take that you know that preparation time to learn not only learn how to do this diet in a way that you enjoy mm. uh, coming from an, a, a whole nother upbringing but also to 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 the land takes time to come to that production stage so it's at least a couple of years where you know there's a lot of nice farmers markets most places and and you might incorporate some like you could you could dry some foods and stuff like that and have a lot of dried fruit in, in the backup and you could do things like that uh, I suppose. in places that are, are that have the seasons you know that i think would have to be more of an option but mm -hmm. i don't even know if you would really need to do that in oh, wow. Hawaii because there could be things growing i mean there are even avocados for example although like some people don't really do a lot of overt fats when they get to this lifestyle but there are avocado trees that produce every season of the year oh, so wow. if you get different varieties you can be having you know different yeah. different avocados every time of the year and you can do that with other things too and maybe right. you'd need to depend on some other people yeah. for more bananas but it would mm -hmm. definitely be available within that region yeah but i I still think there are some some big planning issues that you would need if that was your goal to to eventually have the trees at a fruit producing stage where it's enough food and if something doesn't go right or if it's not a mm. wet season or there's just so many unknowns that it would take I think several years to get even close to that point where you'd be growing it on your own land would, would but you, it's would you it's attract, very, yeah I was gonna ask would you attract a lot of animals and things like that is there any um interest in animals that might show up if you have a lot of fruit in your garden <laughs> in, in, other thing that's kind of interesting to talk uh, about the pest problem <laughs> well yeah we gotta tell you about that so when we live this this way kind of like close to the land there we had so many pests even when we were cooking there were rats the rats would uh -huh. try to get into cages and look for the bread and they'd be uh what uh -huh. you name it the, what were the, the other pests? Um, there were pigs, wild pigs, uh -huh. and oh my deer, God. kinds of things. Where, but, were the, where were the wild pigs? The, in Hawaii? Yeah. Oh, wow. They're pretty, really? They're yeah. Pretty, yeah, they're pretty ubiquitous in Hawaii, but those we could fence those out of our of the orchard, so they weren't really an issue. And But the funny thing was when we transitioned to the, the, the raw fruit-based diet, like, so many of the pest problems went away it's just funny it was All like they them. were almost there because of what that That's produced crazy. you know it was it wild was literally just and then we would go through these periods where we would like have a cooked meal here or there uh -huh. and it literally i don't know if it would just create a certain kind of consciousness <laughs> that we problems but literally the next day we would have like a rat trying to chew through something or oh whatever God. it may it was a direct correlation uh -huh. that was just insane. It uh -huh. literally, the raw food, high fruit lifestyle almost eliminated every single problem from our life that we were mm -hmm. dealing with, with land centric living, with, with our relationship, uh -huh. with the way we interact with our kids on so many levels. Uh -huh. It's phenomenal. It's so interesting. This is all, I've, 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 it's really great to have a conversation with some people that have like some really great experience with trying all these different sustainable kind of ways of living uh it's amazing so fun uh, yeah 
So, well, let's talk about the your pregnancies and I guess particularly your raw vegan pregnancy, but you also had one before that, I think, as well, you said? We did. We've had three, three um, different childbirths and all of them were on our own. All of them were in Hawaii. Um, two of them were in the jungle. The first one, we, we birthed our son underneath a bamboo tree. The second one, we made a, a bathtub out of that bamboo tree and gave birth to <laughs> our girl in a in some water and then th the third one we actually created this lignothermal water heating system where we coiled uh, a pipe a hundred foot hundreds of feet long um, in a decomposing wood chip pile and it created hot water and we called it Hawaii's first hot spring because we <laughs> kind of like a little spring into the ground and we gave birth to our our third um, a child in that and the last two pregnancies and childbirths were were um, fruit based, and um, for both of those, the uh, my water actually didn't even break. The amniotic sac was still intact, and so mm. when both of those daughters came out, they were still in this incredible bubble that just burst as soon as they came into the water. I didn't push at all for those birds. They just were literally ejected from my body and it was so easeful. I didn't have any tearing. I was up that day doing laundry, walking around, you know, just functioning completely this, optimally. <laughs> this is amazing, right? So you're talking about I didn't I didn't know this, but the so when a, when a woman's water breaks before pregnancy, this is a sack that's around the baby in the womb. I, I wasn't yeah. aware that that's how it works. And the little yeah. baby came out in that sack. Yeah, yeah. It was like, you know, I kept waiting for the, for the water to break because that's just mm -hmm. what happens. That's what's supposed to happen. And it shows you that you're in labor. But instead, you know, during my labor, I just, I had, you know, a little bit of an altered state comes when you go into labor. Um, and so that was kind of my key sign was, you know, it's, it, it almost feels like this really almost like a holy state, like you're in the presence of like this holy, you know, the Dalai Lama or Mother Mary or somebody in front of you that's just like so renowned. And um, so that was kind of the triggering of I'm in labor. And then, you know, for my second birth, I was so doing so well during my labor that I actually was carrying like gallons of water because we had, we didn't have hot water. So we had to fill our birthing tub, the one that we made out of bamboo with water. And then when I went into labor, we made this huge fire with all of this ironwood that we harvested. And we went out and we would boil a pot of water and then bring it in and dump it into the birthing tub. <laughs> I had by no means thought that I was going to be doing that during my labor, but I was, I felt so good. And Patrick kept being like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, no, I, I'm okay. Like I'm, I'd have yeah. to kind of like take a few moments to just be with myself at certain times, but it would last for a few seconds. And then I'd go back and keep doing it. And it was just phenomenal how good I felt yeah. during the labor. And then the, the actual birthing experience too was, I mean, she literally, yeah. came, when she came out of me, I was laughing. Like I laughed her out. Like there was so <laughs> much joy. And it was totally, uh -huh. totally replaced all of the pain and the fear that I felt with the first one. And, and I know some people will say like, oh, that was just your first birth. And that one's always harder, but it's no, it's, it's not just that there was a completely different mentality, mindset, Sensations. body, everything was uh -huh. so much more restricted, so much slower, so much more clogged up, mm -hmm. so much more painful, so much more fear. And I know that it was directly correlated to the diet. And I was doing all the meditation and the mind work and everything, but with, it, our, first with our first, with our first one. And uh -huh. it wasn't until that was coupled with the diet, with the high fruit diet that miracles mm -hmm. started to happen that's unbelievable i mean i i find this um, when you were talking about this on the fruity fridays i was just i couldn't believe it you know i've heard stories like this but to really see it confirmed like that was amazing and what you're saying is no pain really you didn't push the 
the waters didn't break and no and you kind of recovered from it pretty quickly and all of these things seem to go against my vision of what birth childbirth is it's always like this is the most painful thing anyone could ever go through and stuff like that like that's what i always hear and then um, the word pain to intense it's the yeah. most intense experience that i feel like anyone could ever <laughs> experience but yeah the pain the pain factor it, the pain is different than intensity and the pain factor for my first was so omnipresent and i got to work with that and that was really beautiful to be able to see like the pain comes and goes and the impermanence of life and all the spirituality of it but then you know to know that that peace doesn't have to exist just even in daily life too you know because it starts with the daily life and then it goes into you know it accumulates and then it can go into your you know your birthing experience or your sporting event or whatever it may be and it's just this accumulative effect of like you've been living a pain-free lifestyle of course you're going to have these miraculous experiences when you you know go to express yourself in these different ways yeah. and I would be curious to know, I mean, we've heard it from so many of the, the other fruit-based um, advocates, but it seems like every person's body that, that starts to choose to, to eat this way, like all the bodily functions, consumption and elimination, like every bodily function is made kind of easier and more enjoyable. I mean, wouldn't you say like even just your daily tasks are, are pretty, pretty remarkably different than they were on your old diet? and so it's almost just been a translation of that to another bodily function that gets just generally more enjoyable. It doesn't mean like that's that way for everybody or necessarily all the time or like this is some yeah. teaching. It's like it tends to get like a lot more enjoyable in every aspect of your bodily function. And it's it's been amazing, like you say, to see that with the birthing aspect yeah, too. Yeah. What what was what was 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 your experience with the second birth and the third birth? Was it different? Did you have a different experience with it from what you saw? Yeah, it just totally blew my mind. It's like with the actual moment of birthing, it's like I almost missed it. It's like she gave birth and I was like, did the baby just come out? Because it, there was so, it was just such, such in harmony with, with the way <laughs> moving. It's like nothing ever happened. She's like, oh, here's the baby pops out into the water and her water never broke. And and she never really did the things like you say that are associated with birthing. It was kind of like just this new sensation. And then out comes the baby. I was, I was like, I almost felt like the birth didn't happen. I'm still waiting for it to happen because birth <laughs> as I knew it never took place there. But my mind was trying to like figure out like this missing piece that, that never it birth as we know, it never happened with that child. Wow. Um, wow. That, that, that moment of coming through the the opening and then yeah, yeah. and then the air like it it was just so fluid it was it blew Amazing. my mind it still does I'm I'm still trying to figure it out um, <laughs> yeah and um, the baby how big was the baby out of interest totally normal size I would I mean we didn't with all of our our birds yeah. we we were off grid we didn't have electricity and we you know we don't know exactly oh, right yeah okay yeah we didn't have a scale weighed, or a time or but they yeah. were all actually I, I would say as i was a little bit bigger than both of them but um both the girls they were they were not tiny by any means like i would guess that they were around eight you know just the average mm -hmm. um it, it was not yeah yeah it's pretty straightforward it's not it wasn't just the size like it wasn't like they were just smaller babies and that's why it was easier it wasn't that you know no oh. well yeah. but with with all of my birds as well they were they were past the technical due date so oh, i thought yeah. i'd even be you know a little bit bigger than mm -hmm. um, because of that having you know time more time in there but yeah, they weren't yeah. they weren't small by any means. Yeah. It just was like the ease and the opening yeah. and everything was was so much more yeah. you know, just fluid and loose and, and yeah. just available for yeah. an easeful transition. And I, I should say for for during that time, sort of the five months leading to the actual birth, 
but we were learning a lot. We were learning a lot of the 80, 10, 10 and, you know, from you guys about how to actually do this and why it works. And, and it was just so different to everything that we'd been brought up believing <laughs> that it did take a lot of time to sort of like coach ourselves into, Oh, I can just sit down to a meal of fruit and that's, I'm going to be okay. And we were, you know, learning how to do this for that whole period. And we were getting some amazing things happening to our own bodies. But then when this birth event happened like that, it sort of started to confirm it even more. And we just, you know, kept building from there. And, and I should say, we still went back and forth even after that time, because we were still relatively new with it. It's not like we understood all the nuances and, you know, what you do when, you, you know, there's not a lot of ripe fruit on your counter and how you yeah. sort of cope with that in all the different ways but it was it gave us enough of a taste to get really curious about this even though we didn't have as much information as we do now that could you know be available to somebody who who wants to consider this diet you know with all the the books that you and others have put out there to really help people learn why this might be beneficial or why they might want to give it a try even though it's so foreign to a lot of our minds it's so unbelievably strange i mean and that's, that's um, just to say a little bit more here, that's kind of why I feel um, really excited about this diet so much of the time is because I was such an, a disbeliever. I mean, Layla had to like drill this into my head that it was even a possibility. And I, I never took it. I was like, no. I, I would bring up like, I would bring up the raw food thing. And then he would always counter it with this article from a Harvard professor about how we've evolved to uh, eat cooked foods. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, or well, just yeah. whatever I, I yeah, just I, took... I, so that is interesting like and there is a lot of there is there are books about that about the idea that humans evolved on cooked food and and all that kind of stuff and it's interesting but then i hear stories like like you guys talking about homesteading and, and i'm just i listen to these guys and they're like oh yeah we wouldn't cook food five hundred thousand years ago and i'm like how did they how are they doing that like <laughs> you know, I, I get, like i'm sure they probably did to some degree but I don't know how sophisticated it would have been if they had like the whole system set up, the equipment they would need. Like, yeah, maybe yeah. they're fire, maybe they are, but I, I don't know. Like, I think they would have needed other food for sure, like uncooked food to to survive at first. But I don't yeah. know. I don't know if they were in the forests with big like pans, <laughs> boiling water in it. Like, I don't know. I just <laughs> does it sound, I, I just don't get like when they say stuff like that you're like how does how would it have worked you, you know but they do i mean there are tribes that do it for sure but yeah um, yeah but i don't know how, if they were doing it that long ago if they figured it out that long ago but anyway Even uh, doing it long ago it still feels like there's room for improvement you know in the human species and so if we can find ways where we feel healthier and happier and better mm -hmm. then why not evolve to that instead of needing to go back to the past or justify why we're doing something now yeah. because we passed yeah i mean you mentioned things like um taro being poisonous and and there's there's so many foods like that as well that we commonly eat that are poisonous um without being cooked right and and but people will say oh yeah we were designed to eat whatever beans or great or uh, these things and it's like but, but there's so many foods like that that are poisonous and kill people in in nature you know and, yeah. and I, I yeah i just i i don't know it's it's interesting but i um i think there was a lot more fruit regardless there was always a lot more fruit in people's um diets than than maybe we believe i think it's one of these things that kind of just gets that isn't even seen as an option like in that book um catching fire because he's talking about well we couldn't have eaten so much vegetables and we couldn't have done this and that and he doesn't really talk about fruit that much you know he just yeah. doesn't even see it as an option and that's what yeah. that's what i think is fascinating is if you were to look at what was the proportion of fruit in people's diets over history i think you would realize it was a lot higher than um then then they uh realize that's my kind of thought on it mm -hmm. so, oh absolutely yeah yeah well, th since then the, the the children you've had how have they been are they eating a lot of fruit do they like fruit how, how does how's it all going since then and and also um we mentioned breastfeeding as well because i think i've known mothers who are omnivore 
you know, mothers, and they worry about breastfeeding or having enough milk, and they usually end up eating or drinking more milk or having more, like that's the solution they think. Um, mm. So maybe you want to, maybe you can tell us a bit about all that. Yeah, I'll let, I'll let Layla talk a little bit about the, the feeding aspect, but maybe before that, I can just mention how it's been for, for our kids and, mm -hmm. and um, how they, how they enjoy it. It's just, that's raising them. That's been their, their definition of food is fresh fruits and vegetables and, you know, nuts and seeds in, in moderation. And, and so when it's time to eat, that's just what they eat and they love it. And it's amazing for them and they look forward to it. And, you know, when they get bored, they can mix things and make it more complicated or when it's simple and they're in a hurry, then they have it, have it more simple. But we've just that's that's another one of the things that that has sort of confirmed this all for us um even though we're still learning and i'm not saying that somebody can't be healthy you know just eating um a vegan diet or somebody can't be healthy eating a traditional diet or or even a car i i i don't know enough to like say what's not possible but i do know what our experience has been and we've never had to take our children to to a doctor or to any medical even holistic uh, medicine we just haven't had the need and that's it's not because we're wanting to be homesteaders or because we're we don't it's not a religious thing it's just they haven't had the need to even consider that it's like they're healthy every day and they have energy and and they're just growing kids and they're having fun and they're crazy and sometimes hard to to um keep up with but in, just in terms of like not needing to address all the health issues that we went through as children and just having the total absence of those com complications has just been another one of these light bulbs of like, oh, we're so we're so glad that this is an option now. It doesn't mean it's like the ultimate or that we won't learn a, a new, better way of doing it or e even a more nutritious way of having a snack or having a dinner or or on and on. But but we do feel pretty grateful that we, we, there's just this total absence of all those issues that we had as children and that even our friends or family continue to have um, even now. It's, and, mm -hmm. and so we wonder, we don't want to like impose this, but it's like, oh, well, have you tried just feeding your kid fruit? Because they kind of like it and, and they do great on it. And, and obviously you have to have enough and there's this whole new way of orienting yourself and your family towards food period in terms of getting enough food and enough you know caloric density and and all those different aspects of the of the diet and lifestyle but to answer your question in terms of how the how kids do on this it's amazing they just don't have a lot of problems that other kids do and they enjoy it and all whenever we go to like a a, a potluck or a community event i mean so much of the time the other children are going to be like turning towards the blueberries and watermelon and like <laughs> trying to put up or like even the really young kids it's fun to watch somebody else's like infant crawl over and like what are they going to go to first it's like they're not grabbing for the the potato salad they're like <laughs> grabbing your watermelon and you're grabbing the, <laughs> the other foods and then a lot of the you know a lot of the, the the other people that might have other beliefs about diet and say have come to like fear fruit and think it's bad they'll try to like teach their kid into not eating fruit and you know maybe that's what we went through as children was just yeah. this repetitive that being taken away or oh no you just have one apple for snack and that's what fruit is but I don't, yeah maybe you can share a little bit more on yeah I could just add to what Patrick said which is that you know two our two older kids have experienced eating everything so they know what's available they know about animal products they know about these different things you know and so there have been periods where we have um but that's just been because they've copied what we were doing which was we'd go back because we didn't quite have this figured out yet but we we common it's common for us to ask them do you feel like anything's missing from your diet is there anything that you want to be eating that you're not eating right now like anything in the world and we we give them the option and they tell us that they feel so happy with what they're eating 
which is so rewarding as a parent. And not only that they feel satisfied, it's not like we're just these strict people that are like, you know, trying to control our kids and all this stuff. It's like, they really appreciate not getting sick. They see so many of their friends getting sick and having all these problems. And, and they, Mm -hmm. they say that they're like, no, we really like eating this way. We like feeling good and healthy and, and happy. And, and so that's really rewarding. And it's also, you know, really neat to be a mother and to feel like we have just totally sidestepped the whole realm of kids throwing up at night and kids <laughs> having these tummy aches or having intense fevers and just feeling how much stress and anxiety that causes, you know, caused our parents and causes any parents in the world to feel your baby is going through something and you have no idea what it is and you don't know how to take care of them essentially because you just have to go take them to a doctor or to a hospital for them to take care of the kids and then you just have to place all of your trust in them to do the right thing which hopefully they will and it's just a really you know hard way to parent I think and so we just feel so grateful that we don't have those issues and that you know we know we know how to take care of them in a way where they're thriving and where they don't feel pain. And even if they do get a little bump or bruise here or there, it heals so quickly that it is, it's almost a miracle before our eyes, how, how quickly something like that will heal. But even that is such an infrequent occurrence as well, Mm -hmm. uh, because they're so embodied, they're so aware of their bodies and, and they're so healthy. And so it's, it's really, it's really quite cool. Mm -hmm. And in regards to the breastfeeding aspect too, um, with my first, I had so many uncomfortable situations around breastfeeding. Um, you know, I don't want to give too much information, but like one of the biggest things was leaking. Like I could just not control. There was so much milk that, (laughs) and the, the baby just wouldn't eat enough of it, it it was too much to the degree where it was causing discomfort for me, I would get mastitis. I, you know, I, there would be times when it was just so sore and swollen. And I just thought that that was what breastfeeding was supposed to be like, I didn't know that it could be another way. And it's so ingrained in mother's heads, that you have to eat plenty of fat. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is that you have to eat a lot of fat so that you're your breast milk is ample and it has everything that the baby needs and it fattens your baby up quickly and all these different things. But, you know, with the, when I followed the 80, 10, 10 protocol through the pregnancy and right after the childbirth, you know, the first thing I was eating was a cantaloupe and all this fresh cantaloupe juice. And, and, um, you know, I didn't have any of those problems. And the only times that I would would be if I would mess with the ratio and, and do way too much fat, even the raw food fat even, could cause mastitis and different problems. And so there's a direct correlation between the fat consumption and the discomfort during breastfeeding, which you would think would not exist because all of these doctors and people are recommending you know, you have plenty, plenty of fat, but I just, and I'm not saying that you don't need any, uh, because I do think that kids require different, a different diet, sometimes even than we do, because they're growing, and they're in a different phase in their life. But in terms of just strictly the mother's comfort and peace of mind, which feels like a pretty pivotal thing to focus on in order to have a healthy child and a healthy family and the clarity that it takes to be able to make the right decisions. Um, you know, it's, I think, a lot less than people recommend and say. So, but no problems breastfeeding the second two. It was just such an enjoyable experience. It was instead of it being painful and, you know, just such a drag at times, it was like every single time a joy, blissful oh, wow. experience. The mm-hmm. hormones would be, get set off so effortlessly. You would, it would just, I would feel happy Mm -hmm. during and after and absolutely no pain. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There was still an abundance 
yeah uh, still an abundance of milk but like not just unregulated chaos it was like i was you know, more in yeah. control of it which uh -huh. was the great part it's like uh -huh. i i knew how to make more milk if i wanted to just increase the fat a little bit more but not so uh -huh. much to make problems you know or uh -huh. increase the calories a little bit more and then uh -huh. it's it's more than enough what's not uncomfortable your, yeah what's your position on like um how long to breastfeed a child do you plan on or have you because i i've known some women that have breastfed children like quite a many 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 years right um mm -hmm. and i've known others that haven't so uh any thoughts on that or what your plans are with that or you know well yeah it would be interesting to hear more hear other people's experiences in terms of you know doing it longer but you 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 say a little I, bit about that. I feel but with our first two, we I wanted to breastfeed my son really, really long. He was the firstborn. Um, but then I got pregnant when um I was probably a year and a half or so into feeding him. And I just didn't feel um I thought I could feed him while I was pregnant with with my second, but it just I was just getting really strong feelings that I didn't need to do that and that he'd had enough and that it was fine to move on. Um, I did kind of have this like romantic vision in my mind of, you know, like the Greek warriors and in Roman times and to like breastfeed them until they're four or something. So they're super strong and healthy, <laughs> but I felt like he got everything he needed. I felt totally fine with that. And that was the same with my second as well. I, I stopped feeding her around a year and a half or so. And she was loving fruit. And because we were just replenishing her with so many fruits and vegetable juices and whole fruits, and, um, you know, it didn't really feel like there was anything missing. Like she was did just they, getting stuff. Did, did the baby start to lose interest in breastfeeding before you stopped it, them or? No, I think that they might have just gone on forever, to be right. honest. It was the day of, like I had to set the boundary completely. And, yeah. you know, I feel like I could have gone on too, but there was just, I just think that so much of parenthood is, is a very intuitive process. And when we really trust ourselves and kind of tune in to what is best for us and what we're sensing about different times, then that's the, the greatest teacher during yeah. that journey. So with this, I definitely think that I fed her a little bit longer than I would have liked to. I think that a year to a year and a half is a good right. amount of time. I think if you have an optimal diet, I mean, I don't mm -hmm. really think that you miss out on anything. And, and sometimes I think it might be even healthier to get them on fruits sooner than to wait so long and be having them have this, you know, a little bit fattier and protein rich milk than just the pure fruit or, or vegetables at times. And so, you know, I, I don't, I'm not against if people want to feed them really, really long, but I think it's worked well for us what we've done. Yeah. I've known, I, so I knew, I've known a few people, but I know one lady that her choice was she wanted to wait until the child made the decision but mm -hmm. she didn't have any other children after that so I think the child kept breastfeeding until like eight years old or something but it probably wasn't that regularly by that point maybe it was just once in a while I don't know um uh -huh. my my own mother her comment on sort of seeing that she said that she felt that was more for the mother at that point than it was for the child <laughs> you know there was maybe the mother was having a hard time with letting go of that uh, uh Absolutely. Too, but i don't know yeah. well it's it's really fascinating because ironically neither layla nor i breastfed at all as children oh, so wow. we just felt so glad that like we were able to do this at all because i mean i don't know the details but as far as I can tell, many mothers are told or told by, you know, the medical profession that that they shouldn't breastfeed, that they should just be giving their babies formula because of their discomfort or physical ailments. They just don't ever yeah. have never breastfed at all, which seems like as a human, that's kind of like the one of the most fundamental basic rights of any mammal is to like be able to breastfeed. But uh, <laughs> compared to that, yeah, I mean, we yeah, it's a mammal, it's a mammal thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and the funny thing um 
so I, I saw a thing that was, <clears throat> in order to digest milk, we create a particular enzyme in our stomach, I think, when we're babies, but that disappears at some point. So, so I've heard this idea that the baby should naturally start to dislike or not want to have it so much because it's like it becomes uncomfortable. But I don't know how true that is. You know, I, I, I just don't know enough about it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's really interesting yeah, I, to hear your story. I definitely didn't experience that with any of our kids, but I think it also could have to do with the mother's diet. You know, like if there's a child that's drinking milk from a mother that's eating, you know, a bunch of meat and milk and eggs, and, you know, they're going to be most likely more colicky and throw up. I mean, that's another thing is that like we hardly had any regurgitation for our raw food, high fruit, you know, babies. And that was not the case with mm -hmm. our first. Mm -hmm. And so what, that what what do you mean by regurgitation? Like uh, what from breastfeeding? Cough, cough up, they cough yeah. up or they spit up. Like you'll breastfeed them for a while. And then it's just been so long that I can't even remember. But I do remember cleaning up so many throw ups from my, from my son. And also a lot of, you know, just more colic, which is like, you know, they'll, they'll start to like fuss and they'll just be fussy and you can tell they're uncomfortable because they have these different, you know, stomach things or they're gassy or they have different things like that. We didn't have any of that with our, with our fruity mm -hmm. birds at, at all. <laughs> it's just I non-existent. Mean, mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, do you, have you ever heard the statistic that human breast milk is the lowest in protein of all the animals? Have you ever heard that one? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's totally yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so you have, I think you said you've written a book about all this. Do you want to let, let us know a bit about what you've written and maybe where people can find it and follow you or, or, or however you want them to interact with you? Sure, yeah, we, we mostly have an account um, called The Fruit Mama on Instagram and it has an underscore after each word. So there's three underscores, The Fruit Mama. And um, the, the booklet that I most recently wrote is a ecstatic motherhood guide. And it focuses a lot on, um, it's 15 days of recipes and contemplations. And it focuses a lot on a high fruit, um, the incorporation of high fruit recipes on whatever your whatever diet women are on it's kind of more of a transitional one I mean I think that if I were to do it now it would be a lot more simplistic and it'd probably just be like straight up fruit like there are different things that are incorporated into into this one that are more for somebody that's transitioning or someone that eats a lot of cooked food but wants to you know have more raw food in their in their diet and then um, there's a lot of different meditations and inquiry um, with each recipe as well and that's a by donation or a free booklet you know depending on if people want to give or not um, and I ask that people just email me at leilaverbants at gmail.com and I can send that over and then we have a book that we pretty much wrote together about our first pregnancy um, Obviously, we were doing the homesteading thing. We weren't vegan at that point. So it's not necessarily along that theme mm -hmm. as much as just kind of um, breaking through self-imposed limitations, working with different fears, and then just living this really adventurous life in the jungle while we, you know, went about growing our baby and our food and giving birth and, and all that. So that is available on Amazon. Um, it's called Sunlight for a Rainbow. And I also am happy to send that for free or by donation to people if they don't want to mm -hmm. buy it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's more of a just a chronicle of the pregnancy itself. Like Layla said, we weren't even aware of the raw vegan path at that time. So that's, you know, not something that we're even Mm -hmm. deliberately putting out there as much as it is just we were able to to you know give birth together and sort of more of the romantic piece of just um living a life or meeting your beloved or whatever it might be nice uh, yeah 
So what what uh, moving on from that, like what what's your lifestyle like at the moment? Um, I guess in, you're so you're still in in Hawaii, and uh, what would be a typical day for you? Lifestyle, diet, all the rest of it. How does it go for your family? Yeah, thanks for asking, Ronnie. We're we're actually in the middle of a uh, taking a break from Hawaii. We we decided to to head off island last year and. So we've been in the Southwest um, for for about half a year now, and and uh, just enjoying a change of scene and sort of waiting to see what our next chapter is going to be. But in terms of the daily life, we're just loving, just total commitment to the to the eighty ten ten lifestyle. Essentially, we started, like Leila said, we it took us a while to transition and to learn just because these yeah. concepts were so foreign to, to where we were coming from. But once we finally did sort of make that commitment, or I don't know if it was a commitment as much of just a correlation between every time we'd go back, an undesirable effect. Every time we have a cooked meal at night, we tried, you know, the raw till four, but every single time yeah. we'd get even if it was just heat in the body or a little bit of achiness, it was just still like, like, why would I want that if I know, if I've tasted something that's more optimal? And at a certain point, we just stopped bouncing back and forth. We just hit the commitment and it's been like amazing um, in terms of not just having those relapses. But to, to answer your question more about a, a typical day, that's kind of the fun part where, um, we, we just sort of sense into what we want to be doing that day. And usually the kids will wake up and eat uh, um, usually a bunch of oranges or some melon first thing, because they, they tend to like to do that. Um, and then Layla and I sometimes will, it's pretty much just the 80, 10, 10. I mean, if you look yeah. at like what Doug Graham's doing, or if you look at, you know, what you guys are doing, you have a big, big mono meal of what you, what you feel like. And maybe, maybe nibble some vegetables Layla and I typically don't do a lot of veggies during the day we'll wait till salad at night but mm -hmm. sometimes kids will want a zucchini or a bunch of celery or they'll grab lettuce in the garden and they'll eat pretty much just uh, unrestricted just an unrestricted diet of when you they get hungry they'll come and ask for for fruits and we try to have an abundance of different kinds mangoes and pears and peaches and guavas and melons and grapes and just have a lot of stuff that's ready and available for them and they'll eat it and then they'll go run off and then we just repeat that as many times throughout the day until they <laughs> brilliant usually yeah usually to to kind of integrate more into our society or make it more fun for them too layla will do these complicate not complicated but more complex meals or make yeah. like dip for the kids or oh. a, a salad or or fake bread that's basically just dehydrated zucchini or you know the fun things like we can still if we feel like we're bored or the kids are bored we can create and make lasagna whatever sure, yeah. you want but the the foundation is there it's just like if you're hungry look at all this amazing fruit eat it have fun and and go on with your day i mean we get like an embarrassing amount of food at the stores when we go <laughs> because we're used to growing you know this is this is a little break as patrick might have told you from our land hawaii. on hawaii where yeah. we, we grow more i would say more than 50 percent of what i would feed yeah. the kids and so then we would only have to have to get the other 50 percent from the farmers markets and the stores and now we're relying almost entirely on that with just a few little gardens here and there and wild yeah. foods that we can find and so we go to the store and people are like, well, do you have a smoothie shop or what's going <laughs> on? You know, they don't believe that this is for our family. And, and when we tell them that they're like, oh, how long is this going to last you? And we're like a week, you know, <laughs> and they can't believe it because we just get so much and we're fortunate that we can do that. But we also definitely feel in our hearts that we always are working towards getting to a point where we can grow the majority of our of our food mostly just because we love growing yeah. fruit trees and it's just tastes so much better to grow things on your own and we're kind of food snobs in that sense but just because um, it's fun i mean you can grow all the rare stuff that's not in stores and just add that much more um um variety to to 
your daily menu, but it's, and just because it's fun, that's part of the lifestyle is getting into the special order durian or whatever it might be, because you don't, you're not paying doctor's bills. You're not paying for, for cosmetic products. You're not paying for all these other things that are associated with that lifestyle. And it's so, it's not like we're, we don't feel like we're giving something up doing this. We feel like we just have as much, if not more room for expression and culinary enjoyment and all the things that we used to have. It's just, it just doesn't slap us back. Amazing. Yeah. Well, awesome. It's been so fun to speak to you both. And I encourage everyone to go and follow the Fruit Mama on Instagram. And Patrick, do you have a place? Do you want to be followed or or what? <laughs> or do you want to stay? See I, 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 people can if I if they want. I'm not really active on the social media platforms right now. I do have an account. It's called Durian Magic. Right. It's so, just so. a antique, silly thing. I don't even have that many. Um, yeah. yeah. It's just more if it's a place for me to to do that if or when I feel like it. But um, awesome, awesome. Yeah, Great. yeah. Layla's Layla's email, and she's we we love sharing it for for people that that can benefit from this message and and are excited to to be part of the community. So what a big thing. What was the email uh, again? One last time. Um. Actually, you know, the email that I'll give that might be better would be Native Radiance. That's native, N-A-T-I-V-E, and then radiance, R-A-D-I-A-N-C-E at gmail.com. That's probably the best one where we both can check that and get back to anyone who ever wants to get in touch. So, Cool. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, well, thanks everyone for watching and listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Please give us feedback and share this with other people. Share this with someone that, that would... That this this message is going to be really important for some people i think so please share it and um, give us a rating or comment whatever you're whatever you can do to support the podcast we um appreciate that and go to fruitfest.co.uk to subscribe and learn more from us and maybe you can join our fruity fridays as well on, on fridays and uh, if you want to learn about the festival go to fruitfest.co.uk slash registration and we thank you all again for listening and watching uh, guys, what what would be your sort of final message for the moment? Yeah, I, I'd like to just say a big a big thank you to to you, Ronnie, and to to all the others who are spreading this message because we know from our own experience that you know had somebody not put out that hand and made this known as an option to us, we would have probably just continued in ways that were really uncomfortable. And so we just want to express our gratitude for those of you that are that are sharing this message or, or helping people understand why and how this can be enjoyable for, for a lot of people. We, we have a big thank you for that and awesome. for the work that you guys are doing. Thank you very much. And with that gratitude, I would just really, oh, just, just support people in um, getting quiet and really getting still and being able to ask, who they want to be and what they want their life to look like and what they want to feel like. And then to just trust that guidance and to just let it happen. And to know that, that Patrick and I are supporting anyone who does that from wherever we are in the world and that you're not alone. And that there's a whole tribe of, of people here that all just want, you know, the best for everyone. So. Thank you very much guys. Thank you everyone for watching and for listening and we'll see you in another episode of the Love Fruit podcast.